Man, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever noticed how when you feel unseen, when you feel hurt, when you feel criticized or even attacked in your relationship, you feel misunderstood, you become instantly defensive. Do you recognize that pattern in yourself? Maybe do you recognize that pattern in your spouse? Look, guys, I get it because I can definitely get defensive But defensiveness in your relationship will dynamically negatively affect communication and make it to where you're not solving any problems. You're only regressing and leading to that contempt and that criticism that we talked about last week. It can lead to unresolved conflicts, increased tension, and ultimately that contempt, that resentment that just breathes in a relationship and destroys it from the inside out. Stephanie and I know because, look, we've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Um, and came back from that stronger than ever. And with some wisdom, we want to impart on you today. So I cannot wait to get into this one. Uh, we've been really excited. This whole four part series has been pretty cool, right? So, oh, yeah. I, well, I hope it's helping everybody on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sharing our knowledge. Look, guys, we get it, man. When you go from contempt to criticism to defensiveness, we're in part three of that today. But welcome to Legacy Driven Marriages, episode number five. five. I'm Walt McKinley, and you heard my beautiful wife's voice, Stephanie McKinley. Mm-hmm. I'm here with my partner in crime. Hey, everybody. Man, so we love that you're here. Take a second and subscribe to the podcast because you do not want to miss one episode. These things are game changers and rocket fuel for for your relationship when you implement the stuff that we're talking about. And we only know that because we lived it in our own 24 year marriage. So like I said, we're in part three of a a four part series on toxic and harmful communication habits, ruining relationships. Today, we're specifically talking about defensiveness in your relationship. So continue to stay tuned as we work our way through these stories, most importantly, to get to these tactical things. What can you do today to help yourself stop being so defensive um, and help your partner stop being so defensive and actually have the conversations that you need to have in your relationship in order to move it forward? Because ultimately, that's what we all want is a healthy relationship. Right. Well, you guys, so um, the first part we talked about contempt, the second part we talked about um, criticism. And today we're talking about defensiveness and they all kind of play into each other. You know, when we are being in that contempt, contemptuous way, or we are criticizing our partner, our natural reaction is to get defensive. And <laughs> trust me, Walt and I have done plenty of this. And by the so way, we speak from experience. Sometimes maybe we had good reason to be defensive because the other person was being critical and hurtful in the moment. So you get defensive, but not mm-hmm. every single time you communicate with your partner, it doesn't come from a place of malice where you need to get defensive. Sometimes you just need to open your ears and listen and really hear what they're saying. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but man, Steph, I, I know for me, when I get feedback and when I I'm hard on myself and I know a lot of you guys are hard on yourself out there. And so when you, sometimes when you get that feedback from the most important person in your life, from your life partner, we can get so defensive, even though we can take that so much better from people outside of our relationship. And that's Mm -hmm. because there's so much love that's there and you don't want to hurt them and you want to be this amazing life partner. And sometimes we're just not, and that's okay too. But man, it's so hard. I almost need to like take it away sometimes and sit on it but my first instantaneous reaction emotionally to any sort of criticism or feedback is to get defensive right it's a protection mechanism so when we feel like it's it's all in how we word it it's the tone it's our body language it's how someone talks to us it's and sometimes that's even yourself like the way you talk to yourself so then if someone says something that or your spouse says something that magnifies whatever you were already feeling about yourself, maybe, then our reaction is to get defensive because we want to protect ourselves. Um, And again, this comes back to sometimes this stems from previous relationships, childhood, could be a lot of things that, you know, we just automatically assume negative intent. Like, you know, like I said, because sometimes that's just even how we're talking to ourselves. We already, maybe we kind of have a uh, self doubt in a certain area. And then someone says something that feels like they're poking at that. 
And then we just immediately react by getting defensive. And I mean, we see this constantly. We do it. <laughs> We've done it a lot. We still fight ourselves on not doing this um, because immediately when you're critical or it feels like someone's being critical towards you, you're going to want to defend yourself. Yeah, I can think of times when maybe my tone sucked with you or the kids and you're trying to just be constructive and let me know, hey, that just kind of came out the wrong way or here's how I took it when you spoke to me in that way. And it's so easy to turn it around on somebody in that moment. Look, I wasn't really trying to be that way, but what you said right before that made me react negatively. And now we're just back and forth. And all we're doing is pointing fingers at each other mm -hmm. instead of actually moving the relationship forward. When really my tone did suck, <laughs> you know, my attitude did suck in that moment. And I got to take responsibility for that. But it's so easy to just, when you're defensive, it's this wall immediately goes up. You can't hear what they're saying. It's like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> they're talking to you. And all you want to do is like point the finger back at them. And really it's just because either you're, like you said, you're feeling bad about yourself or, or you, or you're not even trying to absorb what they're saying and have some empathy for them because it's just, it's all about you in that moment. And man, when those walls go up in a relationship and we know, cause mm -hmm. we did it, it's catastrophe. It is really catastrophe. And, and we talked in episode, um, the first episode of the four part series about contempt, that criticism, the defensiveness we're talking about, how that leads to so much contempt in a relationship. And when you get into that, that cycle of contempt and it's really bad, it's just this negative tornado that continues to just pull you down and spiral your relationship out of control. And sometimes it's really hard to dig out of that place. No, yeah, exactly. I was going to say nothing, nothing really good comes from it. Like, so if you find yourself on the defensive and you're having to, you're either making an excuse or you know, you can tell you're having to defend yourself. It's not going to go anywhere good because already you're just like, you didn't really take in what they said because you, if you're reacting in that way, then you took it personal. And now it's about you and how to protect yourself. And you're not, it's not going to go anywhere from there, but more of a negative spiral. So that's kind of what we want to make you aware of today. And we, we brought some more examples to share with you guys. To... And we appreciate that you guys love our acting skills over the last couple of weeks as we portray the realism of what these actually sound like in a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the fun part. Right? <laughs> so, so we want to give you five different ways defensiveness shows up in your relationship. So what we're talking about, this is always right. Be self-accountable. Be honest with yourself. If, are you doing these things? Think about whether or not your spouse is doing these things. And then we're going to talk about what can you do about it once you get that self-awareness because Every single one of these things, I'm pretty sure you and I have done to each other. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> when I was going through it, I was like, check, check, did it, did it, did it. Yeah, this looks familiar. <laughs> oh, man. So, look, so go ahead, Steph. Take that first one right there. So this one came up before under, I'm pretty sure it was under criticism, maybe mm -hmm. both. Um, the always or never statements. So you always do this or you never do that you always blame me for everything or you never listen to what i have to say when you make those kind of statements it's a it's a generalization it's an exaggeration and m more than likely it's not accurately <laughs> describing the situation because no one does something always it might feel that way to you but the reality is it's probably not always the situation so immediately though, you know, when your spouse says like, you always leave your clothes out or you, uh, what is your reaction going to be immediately? Yeah. You never help with the kids. Yeah. God, you're always nagging me to put the toilet seat up just because you fell in it one time. But the, the, you, and you know, what's crazy is like, we all do it. Even if you just said, Hey, the majority of the time, I don't feel like you're really helping with the kids. That sounds so much different than you never help. With yeah, exactly. Crazy. It's like one word in there changes the whole dynamic of the sentence. Yeah. And, and by the way, the way it's received for sure. 
And tell me how you're not going to get defensive when someone says that to you. What do you, I mean, what are you going to say to that? You're immediately going to say, that's not true, or it's not always. And you're going to give some example of when you did it and try to negate what they said. So from there, it's just going to be <laughs> a back and forth of mm. blaming and defending and, you know. It's like a competition. Who can say you never do something more than the other person <laughs> until somebody walks away? <laughs> because no conversation ever. I could probably say this absolutely. No good conversation ever came, came from saying you always or you never. If you catch yourself starting a sentence like that, just stop and say, I'm going to reset this sentence I'm about to say right now. <laughs> Let me start over, please. All right. So number two, when you tell somebody, and I have people in my family that do this, mm. that's not what happened. Mm. Or you know what? You're remembering it wrong. It, when you deny somebody's feelings, when you invalidate their feelings and their perspective, all you do is escalate that situation with the person. It really such a dismissive statement. You know what? That's not how you feel. That's not what really happened. I'm going to tell you what happened. I know for a fact, there's three parts to every story. <laughs> there's your side, there's my side, and there's the truth. <laughs> and you and I will absolutely skew our perspective to the side that makes us sound and look better. But there is, because I get that way. If you, if you and I are thinking about something, right, we're talking about something. You're like, that's not what happened. I'm like, no, but immediately I get defensive. Like, bullshit. I know, I know how I remember what happened. <laughs> I know what I said. Don't yeah. tell me what I said. But really, you remember it a different way. Maybe you didn't even, aren't saying exactly what I said, but it's the tone I said it in that made you remember it a certain way, but I'm not remembering that tone in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, true. exactly. And I think that's what we all need to remember is no two people, like if you've ever had a situation happen and you asked everybody in the room what happened in that moment, they're all going to describe it differently because it's not it's based on their own experiences and how what they saw and you can't view yourself. So <laughs> they're going to see it differently than you, no matter what. So whenever we come at people like that's not how it happened. Well, that's how it happened for that person. Mm. And it's different for you. And there may be some pieces of it that are the same, but not everything about it's ever going to be the same because it's based on your own experience. So he's right. You can never really, you can't tell someone else that didn't happen unless, I mean, they're just really throwing in false information that you know, you know, that lightning didn't strike at that time yeah. or something. I mean, it's like my three-year-old niece. She's like my kids when they were three. They had these vivid imaginations and she just made up makeup story. She just will literally make up a story <laughs> in the moment. And it sounds like a good story. Really but I big. know the unicorn didn't fly down and give her some Skittles. I know it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So in those moments, okay, you know that's not what really happened. And I'm being funny, but we do this to each other all the time where you're like, they're so full of shit. That's not what really happened. Let me tell you what happened that makes me look good and makes them look bad. Let me explain all of that to you. That's what we do as human beings because we get mm -hmm. defensive. Yeah. So what you can really say is, that's not how I saw it, or, you know, something to that effect, but you got to make it about your feelings and not the other person. Or, hey, my, my perspective is a little different on that. Here's kind of what I took away from it. Right. So much different. Yeah. And the reaction will be so much different. It will be more of a response than an emotional reaction if you change your narrative and the way that you explain it. Or you can say, that's not how I remember it. <laughs> but not you're remembering it wrong. <laughs> so the next one is it's not my fault or you're overreacting. So again, you're telling someone else how they feel, uh, shifting blame or minimizing the other person's emotions is another way that we get defensive. That's a tactic that we use when we're trying to defend ourselves. Um, and that is to avoid taking responsibility. So like he was saying, you have to take ownership of your own, feelings. You can't say how someone else feels. You can't, you know, tell them that's not how they felt. You don't know. Like mm -hmm. you don't know that. 
Well, especially that it's not my fault. I mean, think about when you were teenagers and you didn't want to take responsibility for none of the crap you were doing that you shouldn't have done. <laughs> right. And, and and so immediately your parent may say, Hey, well, you did this. And you're like, it's, it's not my fault, Johnny. They, they wanted me to go and they were driving and I couldn't get out of that situation. And I just went along with it. And you remember that old thing mm. people would say, well, if they jumped off of a bridge, yeah. you know, oh, I used to hate that. I used to hate when people would say that kind of stuff to me, but it's so true. If you, if you aren't even adult enough, because we're talking about marriage and adults to take responsibility for what you did, they might be overreacting emotionally to what you just said. But you got to take responsibility for the thing that you just said that caused the emotional reaction in the moment. And if there's a visceral reaction, they probably have some work to do. And you have some ownership to say, hey, man, that's a really big trigger for my spouse. I should probably either figure out why or maybe just not say that that way again. <laughs> right. Let's rephrase. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it's not my fault. Imagine, uh, you know. I, I, you were, you were talking to some other chick and, and you, you, you cheated on me. It, it, it's not my fault. <laughs> it's not my fault. It's my childhood and my abandonment issues. And I'm working through all that. Oh, you went and spent all the money in the bank account and now we're broke. It's not my fault. Target had a sales. <laughs> I even used coupons. <laughs> Should have just had more money in the bank. Do you see how ludicrous it's not my fault sounds? But that's what we do because we don't want to take responsibility and accountability for how we're contributing to whatever that situation is. Very true. <laughs> I like that example on the, especially the target. <laughs> Cause Steph will really be doing that. Look, I'm a segue for a second. Steph will go to like um, bath and body works. They got them sales, right? Look, all you fellas know when the ladies go to bath and body works on the soap sales and all that, she come back. I use this coupon and this coupon. And she goes, yeah, I say $40. <laughs> and I'm like, well, how much did you spend? Okay. I, I saved $40. He's like, but you didn't really save $40. You not $40 more dollars in our account. I was like, I'm pretty sure when I looked, I saw $67 that Bath and Body Works was it. spent. <laughs> so, uh, but it's funny, but she doesn't say it's not my fault. She was like, well, we needed some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> A big difference in the narrative there. Um, so, all right. So number four is, but what about when you, it's like, man, that counter attacking somebody, bringing up things from the past and past grievances that you said you forgave them for really does derail any conversation you can have about what's happening right now. Yeah. But, but you remember when you did this to me. So now three years later, I did this to you. So it's justified. <laughs> well, that's definitely holding resentments mm. and that, that really shows in that. In saying that, but what about when you, that means you never let that go. There was never any forgiveness or accountability probably taken there because you're still bringing it up. So it never got resolved. And, and then, like he said, you can't bring that into some new argument because it doesn't apply. <laughs> the other person is not going to take well to that. And they're just going to dismiss whatever you're saying because they're like, oh, now you're bringing up something that like happened how long ago we're not dealing with that right now so obviously you're not even in the same conversation like <laughs> mm -hmm. well it just it's deflection to make it to where they don't have to take accountability it just shows you probably need to have, circle back and have a different conversation about the but what about when you moment <laughs> that they're hanging on to but what happens to me is but what about when you did this to me and so then let's say you shut the other person down in that moment, they shut down and they're like, fine, I guess we're even or whatever they think in the moment. All you do is sweep another problem under the rug. Mm. You brought up one from three years ago. We shut the swept under the rug and now we're going to sweep another one under the rug. And then what are we going to keep doing that until there's so much resentment and contentment in our relationship that all we want to do is get a divorce. Then we wonder why we got to this point in our relationship and we wonder why things aren't working out and we can't even have a conversation with each other anymore. But really it's because you never dealt with the problem that you should have dealt with in the first place. Cause all you did was deflect. So you didn't have to take accountability for your own actions. We've all done it. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and that's a, how we keep repeating the cycle. Then we get in that negative cycle and we just keep doing that to each other and nothing good comes from it. <sighs> Truth. This next one, I feel seen on this next one. I'm just going to let you guys know. Stephanie's going to do number five. But man, I read this one. I thought this first part of this <laughs> definitely is me sometimes. It says, I was just joking or you're too sensitive. Which again, so here we are dismissing the other person's feelings again. And and now you're kind of, this is like, it's kind of attacking you. It's like, if you say someone's too sensitive, now you're attacking who they are as a person, their character. They're, how are they not going to get defensive about that? Mm -hmm. Like, who are you to judge how sensitive or non-sensitive I should be? Like, you don't know what's happened to me and why I feel sensitive about that subject if you're saying that to me. And obviously, if I am feeling sensitive about it, there's something there for me. So that's where we have to recognize in our spouse, like when we see them get upset, if you say something like that to them and they're upset, then clearly you hit a, a trigger for them that is from something. And you should probably have more of a conversation about finding out why that is, because then you would avoid that next time. <laughs> well, and. and You've, because I've told you this, I was just joking around. Like, why are you so upset about it? I was just joking around. And I think a yeah, lot Yeah, but anytime of, someone says a joke, there's always some truth in it. Right, So right, right. And because you've gotten defensive when I said that. But like you said, there's, it's really a jab. The joke is really a jab at your partner. And the jab is a half-baked truth that maybe you just don't have the cojones in that moment to come out and just say to them. You don't have the courage to just come out and just say and have the conversation that you need to have. So you just jab them. You just jab them. Then when they get upset, you say, well, well I was just joking. Golly, calm down. And I, I, y'all, I have done that one. I'm telling you right now, out of all these, that is probably the one that I've done the most in our 26 years of being together. Just a little jab, man, just enough. And you think you're going to finesse them to do what you want them to do. And all they do is dig in their heels and get upset because now you cause an emotional reaction instead of having a conversation where maybe they could have responded in a way that you guys met a compromise to move your relationship forward. Gotta be, and I think guys are a lot worse at this one specifically than the ladies are because men are brought up. They jab each other all the time. They <laughs> give each other a hard time. That's, that's, how, that's how you know you're liked by another dude. Well, I was gonna say that's kind of how men bond. But women don't take it the same. We're, we are more sensitive generally in our feelings. So we're more in tune with them. So, yeah, it doesn't always go well with us. Yeah. If you're, Some if, personality types do because if they're that personality type. I, I know a lot of women that they do the joking too. But you can but, tell when it's truly joking. And right. you could tell when it's just it, a jokingly veiled jab <laughs> at your partner. When, if you tell your partner, oh, man, look at that muffin top. You need some, I need some butter for them muffins. I promise you, nothing good will come from that. You can't be like, I'm just joking. You're being really sensitive right now. You can't do that. You, you got to realize when your joke is a jab or when you and your partner are just giving each other a hard time. Because Stephanie and I do give each other a hard time. We like to mess with each other. But I've learned over time not to take that to the next level when really there's some contempt well, I think as, too. I think as a spouse, you know your partner's sensitive areas. You already know what they're, a lot of us know what our partner's sensitive about. That's why we mm -hmm. can hit those hot buttons. And a lot of times you'll say that joke as like a way to say what you wanted to say and make it seem like, oh, but I'm just joking with you. I'm just, even though the other person knows, oh no, you were trying to tell me that. So, okay, so we just went over five different examples. I am sure, I'm 100% sure, no doubt, every person listening to this falls into one of those categories, at least. If you're like me, you probably fall into all of them. Every single person listening to this has a spouse that falls into one of those categories. And so, as always, the most important thing that we do on the podcast is talk to you about, now, what can you do about it? You built awareness. You're being honest with yourself. If one of those are you, give yourself some grace and forgiveness. If one of those are your spouse, give them some grace and forgiveness, and let's talk about what you can actually do about it. Yeah. Let's talk about how to not do this. <laughs> how do you reverse these toxic communication habits? 
So first, assume positive intent. This is really hard sometimes. <laughs> it's so crazy how we'll assume it with other people, but we assume the worst from our spouse all the time. I know. I don't know why. I just, I don't know. I think we're programmed to just always assume it's negative and always assume that they're trying to do something bad to us. When in reality, sometimes it's just a, like, they're just really asking a question or they just really were curious or we're trying to find something out. They really didn't know. And you take it as, oh no, you, that was just your way of you know, jabbing me and saying something to get me, you know? So this is, <laughs> so we're going to say, so just assume the positive until they say otherwise. I mean, mm -hmm try to go with it as a positive and you know like i don't know can you think of an example right now what like something you would say that could go either way that would be negative or positive well i think just actions to me i always think positive intent verbally but actions too so let's say we're trying to go somewhere and you're trying to get ready because y'all know if you listen to this long enough, you know, being late is, is my thing. I don't like being late. And you were like, okay, I'm going to be ready on time. And, and you just got caught up doing other things in the house or, or, you know, maybe you felt sick and you had to lay down or maybe you had to use it like me, who, who cares what it is. And we're running late. Now I can sit there and I could think, and I've thought this before. See, every time you're never on time, <laughs> never, right? You're, we're or always late. late. Um, and then just start to spiral negatively. Now I feel like you're doing it on purpose. When really, if I just assume positive intent, if I say, hey, we're running a little bit late. Can I help you with anything? Like, are you, you feeling okay? Or, or, or whatever it may be. And by the way, then she's got to receive that with positive intent too, right? She's got to assume Oh, well, maybe he knows I got to do two more things before we go. So he'll do them. Yeah. Can you help me out with A, B, and C? Can you refill my water cup before we go? Can you go grab my glasses? Like I'm trying to hurry up. And man, when you can like assume positive intent in situations and that's your mentality, the amount of arguing you, you do with each other will be significantly diminished. I mean, I mean, I mean, really diminished and the, the state of your relationship will elevate almost immediately. And this is with every relationship you have in your life. There's people that are going to hurt you. And there's people that have negative intent and malice in those moments because they're dealing with their own stuff. But when you can assume positive intent with people that you're around constantly, especially your spouse, you just end up feeling better and more joyful most of the time, which has an effect on how everybody feels when they're around you. It is really magic. Mm -hmm. Hard magic. <laughs> magic. <laughs> yeah. So. I know there's times where that that's a big one in our relationship is the that's probably our biggest fight all the time is Walt really likes to be on time and I'm usually a person who runs late. So that's always our argument is right. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> when we have to get somewhere and we're ready to get somewhere and he's like trying to tell me hours out, Steph, go get ready. Start getting ready now because I don't want to be late. <laughs> For real. Well, and I think it's so tough because when you get in a negative mind space and I challenge myself, I'll still do it sometimes. We're always running late and I have to genuinely, and this goes into part two after assume positive intent, you got to take responsibility. You have to really say, Hey, how am I contributing to the conflicts in my relationship? I know when I think always anything, it's an immediate negative emotional response in that moment. And sometimes that means I'll negatively walk in with the tone like, I already told you, we got to get going. We're running late. We can't be late. No, 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 no. And then you're like, hey, I'm trying to get ready. Don't come in here all negative on me. You know, and so for the, those of you guys who think that Steph and I don't argue just because we do this, <laughs> don't get it. Don't, don't trip. Like, we're still married. <laughs> but we just don't stay in the space, right? But I know if I'm not sensitive with assuming positive intent, and I don't catch myself when the always and the never do things happen. And then I don't take responsibility for, for my actions after that. And I don't take responsibility to say, let me get out of this headspace. Well, it's not all the time. It's sometimes, 
It seems like the majority of the time sometimes, but it definitely is not always. And I got to take responsibility for how I negatively contribute to the relationship. And that's why I said the first five things we talked about, the examples, how defensiveness shows up. I've done all of them. The criticizing stuff, <laughs> I've done most of them. The con way contempt shows up in a relationship, I've done a lot of them. And you know what? So is Stephanie. But if we just point our finger at our partner and we don't ever put the mirror on ourselves, how are things really going to get better? Because I got to change too if I'm going to be a better partner for my spouse. Yeah, take responsibility, I think is a big, uh, really, really, probably almost more key than the first one we said because nothing's ever going to get better if we don't take responsibility for our own actions. No one can change someone else. So no matter how much my spouse wants me to change, if I can't accept that I had some part in it, it's never going to change because he can't change it for me and I can't change him. So if I don't correct the actions that, you know, if I don't take responsibility and I don't say like, well, how am I contributing to this? And I don't work on changing those. It, it's not going to go anywhere. It takes both people owning their own things. Because like we said, you can't, I can't make him do it. He can't make me do it. He can't make me be on time as much as he tries. <laughs> And believe me, he tries <laughs> really, really hard. I've tried all the communication stuff we've talked about. It only works part time. And to be honest, I've told Walt this. And what I've found is, and the more that he does that, the more I dig in my heels and want to do the opposite just to make him more pissed off because I'm like, how dare you tell me what to do? <laughs> well, it, well, the more I do the negative aspects of that. Right. right? But there's other things that I'll do now. Uh, I'll, if we're in a hurry to get out in the morning and she's getting dressed, look, I don't have to put makeup on. All I do is splash some water in my hair and <laughs> shift it to the side because I don't have a lot of it anymore. It takes me a tenth of the time it takes her to get ready. And Stephanie doesn't even take as long as most people take. So I know I can make the bed real quick. I know if I can like make us something for breakfast, protein shakes real quick. I know I can fill her. I know there's, there's things that I can do to contribute, right? So taking responsibility means doing the positive things too. I can do some positive things and take responsibility for us trying to get out of here on time by doing things that I know she'll need to do before we go. Mm -hmm. And, and then they recognize that, right? You recognize mm -hmm. that I do that kind of stuff, but it, it took me taking responsibility and realizing that I wasn't doing that stuff. I was just bitching and complaining about being late and pressing her to realize that like, I wasn't positively contributing to any aspect of that too. I had to change and started with responsibility. Right. So the next one is focus on I statements. So <laughs> this is where we were saying like, if you're going to say, you don't tell them you never, or you always, or you say, I feel like this, or I feel like there's a, an issue in this situation or whatever. Like, I feel like we need to save more money. Could we do this? But you don't make it about them. You're not putting the blame on them. You're taking that accountability yourself and you're sharing your, just your feelings. You can only speak for yourself. So it's just always better when you come to them and say, you know, I, I'm just feeling this way. Can we talk about it? You know, instead of coming at them and blaming and, you know, anytime you use any of those examples we just talked about, you're putting that person on the defensive where if you come to them saying, I, they can't get defensive. Then it's, it's not about them. Mm -hmm. It's you're taking ownership of your own feelings and saying how you feel about it. And honestly, when you say you feel something, no one can tell you that you don't feel that. And it may not be what they feel, but they have to respect that you have your own feelings and they can't control that. All they can control is their own feelings and their own actions, and they can contribute to the solution, but they can't change, you know, they, they can't say you didn't feel something. And, and by the way, if you're saying I, they're not going to get defensive. So you're taking away that, you know, blaming aspect of it. And that leads you to a solution because if you're just sharing your feelings, you're being open and honest and vulnerable with how you feel about it, then they don't really have any choice but to want to 
come to some kind of compromise or solution to make that better. And by the way, maybe they still struggle to find the compromise and solution, but that's on them. You controlled the controllables in that moment was your own emotion. And it was the way that you articulated what you needed in the relationship, but you can't control anything past that. And I like that you said I versus you at the beginning of that. And I don't want people to miss that stuff because as soon as you say you take you out of your vocabulary when talking Mm -hmm. to your spouse, you will immediately escalate a situation. When you say, I feel like insert whatever the problem is. And I would like if we insert whatever the solution (laughs) is, right? I feel like when I'm talked to in a tone that's negative, it makes me upset and it makes me defensive and it makes me just want to react and negatively respond back. I would love to be talked to in a tone that's a little bit more caring and empathetic. Here's what that looks like for me. I didn't even say you in Mm. any part of that. And by the way, guys, you (laughs) got to work on this stuff anyway, because if you think this won't come up in another relationship after the one that you're in, you're crazy. The same things are going to come up. So water the grass on your side of the fence and work on them with the person you chose to spend the rest of your life with. Instead of thinking that you're going to find something better someplace else. And I promise you, as you work on yourself, your partner will have no choice but to start working on themselves. But if you keep the finger pointed at them and you keep criticizing them and you keep contempt and you keep getting defensive, all you're going to do is continue to push them away. It really does take both to make it work. So I don't want to absolve accountability for anybody else. But ultimately, you got to work on this anyway, no matter what. So why not challenge yourself today so that it may have a fruitful effect on your relationship tomorrow? That's what we're talking about. That's why this stuff is really important. All right. So what's this last one? And we talked about this. I I feel like this four-part series, every one of the keys that we talk about (laughs) is focus on the solutions, not the blame. Blaming somebody does nothing. Blaming except make them do that. Piss somebody off, right? So blaming somebody doesn't do anything. Nobody's mm-hmm. ever going to respond positively to blame. Nobody's ever going to sit back and think about where they're accountable or where they need to take responsibility. But all you're doing is pointing the finger at them and blaming it. But man, when you can shift your mindset, even in the most hurt moments, even in the most upset moments, to saying, "What do I really need in these types of moments to feel better about the direction that we're headed?" And you shift that to a solution-focused resolution for whatever that issue in your relationship is, you start to really build magic. And the response from your partner gets less reactive emotionally and starts to get more responsive emotionally. And then they start to do the same thing. And if you can have this conversation with your partner and do it together, (laughs) if you can work on this together at the same time, damn, y'all, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you want to talk about, it's like putting the best fertilizer on that grass that you thought was dying on your side of the fence and putting fertilizer that just makes it look like the best lawn in the whole entire neighborhood. That's really what it does. But you got to really implement and execute on these things that we're talking about to make it work. Yes. A hundred percent agree. <laughs> look, I got, I got stuff over here. Look, like, okay, babe. Okay. Go ahead and rock it out. Um, but seriously, you guys, this is, um, I'd say this is probably one of the biggest lessons I, we took away from all the things that we had been through where we were in a bad place and trying to work our way out of that, um, was the idea of this, like approaching conversations differently. It's all in how we say things to each other. So again, we're coming back to that communication. This is all parts of communication. But this is the biggest one. I think if you can switch from saying you to I, just remember that. The next time you get into a situation where conflict is building or your partner, or your partner got uh, attack mode and started to say you this, You step back and say, okay, how can I change this conversation moving forward to something that's going to be solution-oriented? 
And every time you change it from you to I, and you just share your feelings, open, honest, and vulnerable, then you really can't go wrong. It's, it's all in how we say things to each other, that we're not attacking our partner, that we come to them just sharing our own feelings, saying how we feel, I feel this, and then a way that you can make it better. So really, it's, it seems like it's simple, but I know it's, it's really not simple when it comes to the action part of it, because this is hard to shift how, like, shift yourself from that negative to the positive intent, and also shifting the way you say th- things in a way that is not blaming. Always come to your partner and say, hey, I'm feeling like this. Can we talk about it? Or can we find a solution? And I guarantee you, I mean, how could someone not respond in a more positive way when you come to them in that manner? I know for us, it it really dynamically changed our relationship. We still find ourselves, we catch ourselves and we find ourselves doing it. And that, but we are a lot faster to change and come back and sometimes have to apologize or just be like, hey, that's not what I meant. I'm sorry. And even if you have to do that, hey, and that's a step forward. That's progression. That's what we want. I mean, that's all we can ask for each other is let's just keep progressing in a positive direction and finding solutions instead of finding that contempt and that criticism and the defensiveness. We want to get away from that. So just just remember that I statement. Every time you go to say something to your partner, stop and say, I. Tell yourself, I, I feel like this. I love it. And here's what I want to say to wrap up today. We talk about culture when it comes to corporate America all the time. It's all about building a positive culture. It's all about uh, building a culture where people feel seen and heard. It's all about building a culture that people assume positive intent. We don't never talk about the culture that we're building in our own family. We need to get back to the fundamentals, and that's what we're talking about. Stephanie said it right. This stuff still isn't easy to execute on. It's difficult because there's so much more emotion involved. Focus on building a dynamically positive family culture where everybody can feel seen and heard, where everybody feels loved, where everybody has a voice, where Mm -hmm. everybody assumes positive intent. That is the difference between being legendary and the difference between ending up one of the 52% of America that ends up in their first marriage and divorce. It will change the foundation of who you are as a family forever. But you got to take responsibility today and say, I'm the one. Me and my spouse, we're the psycho breakers. We're going to change it now. And we're going to start creating the culture we want to have in our family and that we can be proud of. And so look, guys, thanks for joining us again. Talk about culture building. Commit to building that culture. Commit to building your marriage. Commit to building that family environment you want by going to LegacyDrivenMarriages.com. Sign up for our weekly newsletter. Um, It includes all these marriage tips that you're hearing on here, plus more just really tactical advice you can use to become that power couple that each and every single one of us want and that we can be. So go to LegacyDrivenMarriages.com, sign up for the newsletter, and get that every single Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I know you need it because when I'm creating it, it makes me intentional. (laughs) I still need it too. (laughs) Um, So look, guys, until the next time. Get into the arena of your marriage, keep fighting for your relationship, and keep elevating your generational legacy. And we'll see you guys next Tuesday. Let's go.